Dr. Stephen Gundry. He is a very interesting character. And this podcast, I learned quite a lot about leaky gut, how to test for it, what are the types of tests that he uses. I learned about glyphosate and how that could cause food sensitivities, how to counteract food sensitivities. I also got his opinion on lipoprotein A, ApoB, LDL, so all the lipids to see whether he thought that increased cardiovascular disease since he does have credentials there. We talked about Tudka and its importance in food sensitivities. I asked him to rank a whole bunch of foods from best to worst, and some of those included grass-fed red meat versus regular antibiotic chicken and white rice and beans. And uh, I I found that uh, he was really insightful in a bunch of ways. I feel like He brings new and interesting information to the table. And every time I talk to him, I learn something new. This is the third time he's on the podcast. You know, when I first spoke to him, nobody really knew about him. And then he blew up. He wrote a bunch of books. He got a bunch of PR. He's adapted his positions over time. So it's interesting to see that he's very open minded and he's willing to change his positions. And I think I gained some really good information. So if you're interested in gut, leaky gut, those kinds of topics, this is going to be very interesting. I would definitely recommend the podcast. Welcome to The Joe Cohen Show. Join me as I share my experience with biohacking and invite top health experts to explore the latest technology, supplements, research, and resources for optimizing your body and brain. Hey, everyone. I'm here with the excellent Dr. Gundry, the man who needs no intro. Uh, Dr. Gundry has studied lectins for a while and the gut. And we've actually spoken twice before, two different podcasts way back when. And he was one of the first guys, uh, definitely the first guy that made it very popular, the whole lectins topic. And, uh, and so I learned a lot from him about that because as my audience knows, I also had a lot of food sensitivities and I reacted to a whole bunch of different foods and I couldn't Basically, at one point, I was on just like a meat diet, uh, like a carnivore diet before carnivore got popular. And that's why I was looking into like, what is in food that's just giving me brain fog every time I eat some food? And so then you came along and I, and I was already thinking it was lectins and I was searching and then I found you. You did a paper. You had the you know, paper uh, and you spoke about lectins. And, and that's when I really thought like, OK, this guy's on something. And then you became, you know, you blew up. and. You had a whole bunch of great stuff. You published a bunch of books, The Plant Paradox. Uh, you're working on a new book as well. And there was a bunch of other books as well. Uh, what, what's your new book going to be called? So the new book is called Gut Check. And it'll be okay. out January 9th uh, of this coming year. So Awesome. So looking forward to reading that as well. I guess, uh, you know, we haven't spoken for a while, so... Describe your ideal diet. And I, I think you've also had a little bit of an evolution over time. Maybe I'm wrong, but uh, uh, tell me your, what is your current opinion of the ideal diet? Like, w- what would it consist of? So I think I talk a lot about this in, in the upcoming book. Um, but my first book years ago was called Dr. Gundry's Diet Evolution. And uh, one of the things that uh, I get to do is as new information comes out, uh, I'm one of these guys who thinks I ought to change my mind about something. Um, There are people out there who, despite 30 years of research, despite knowing about the human gut microbiome, they haven't changed their dietary advice in 30 years, which uh, continues to amaze me. Um, Of course, many of these people don't treat patients. um, And I still see patients six days a week. Um, I see patients on Saturday and Sunday. I have a full clinic clinic. This is a Friday. I have a clinic this afternoon and uh, tomorrow and Sunday. Uh, So I, you know, continually look at the blood work of my patients every three to six months and ask them to take away certain foods, ask them to add certain foods. And 
we get to see you know, what happens to them, not only in how they feel, but actually how their blood work looks. So I guess what's happened through the years, um, I've gotten closer and closer and closer to thinking that Hippocrates was absolutely right 2,500 years ago when he said all disease begins in the gut. And how that guy knew that 2,500 years ago uh, continues to amaze me. Uh, but not only was he right, uh, thanks to work from uh, Alessio Fasano, who's now, now at Harvard and, and others, including myself, um, we know that all disease begins with a leaky gut. And that was actually the title of a talk I gave to a gastroenterology conference in Paris a couple of years ago. Uh, and the good news is, uh, in my humble opinion, all disease can re be reversed in the gut. And so uh, the, the concept of leaky gut or intestinal permeability, which used to be pseudoscience, uh, now has not only fine foundation in science, but we now can measure the degree of leaky gut. And we now have pretty sophisticated tests, blood tests that can determine how certain foods uh, interact with not only the wall of our gut, but uh, as I talk about in the new book, uh, the lining of our blood vessels has a, a sugar coating called the glycocalyx. The blood-brain barrier uh, has a sugar coating, the glycocalyx, and even the joint surfaces have the same glycocalyx. And we now know that one of the attack points of lectins and other compounds is to attach to these sugar molecules. And I happen to think that plants are pretty smart and they have a defense mechanism against being eaten or their babies being eaten. And the more I see how number one smart plants are, but number two, actually how intelligent the microbiome is, how intelligent bacteria and fungi are. Uh, keep coming back to Hippocrates was right. All disease begins in the gut. That's incredible. And, and so I love that you're a type of guy who, uh, evolves essentially right as new information comes up and and i feel like there's not enough people like that a lot of people are set in their ways uh so that's that's great what i also really like is um what you just said about the lab tests so i'm a huge proponent of testing whether it's genetics lab tests i think the more information you have the better you can make decisions just like if you have a company if you have a uh, car, or whatever, you, you need these diagnostic tools to be able to see if you're going in the right direction, because then it's not a, really a matter of so much of what someone's opinion is. It's look at the facts. We know that if you bring this marker down, then it has better outcomes. And that's just the fact. And so this thing that you're going to do is going to bring this marker down. That is the type of uh, advice that I think is like, that's where I think we need to move. So Take me through a couple examples of, you know, a, a type of advice that you gave and certain lab markers improved significantly from that type of advice. And, and you know, th these examples should be general of something that you see very commonly. Yeah, well, let me, I've now um, published a couple of papers about, uh, autoimmune disease reversal. About 80% of my practice now is autoimmune diseases. People who you know, have been everywhere uh, don't want to be on these immunosuppressive drugs or the drugs uh, haven't been effective. And part of the blood tests that we, we get uh, are, are markers of leaky gut. And also uh, we look at uh, IgG markers of the various components, antibodies to the various components of wheat, like 
wheat germ agglutinin, which is a le- very small lectin. Gluten has multiple molecules, uh, but gluten is a lectin, and about 25% of the proteins in wheat are non-gluten. So we can actually measure people's antibodies to these various forms of wheat. And one of the things that's fascinating to me when we first started this is that 100% of people with leaky gut and or autoimmune disease, and 100% of people with autoimmune disease have leaky gut, let me preface that, 100% have IgG antibodies to gluten. 100%. Even if they've been gluten-free for 10 years or more. About... yeah, the right. IgG test is like, uh, there's, you know, um, there's companies that offer these IgG tests for food sensitivities. And so you're saying if somebody gets a high IgG for gluten, that means that they are sensitive for gluten. That gluten. not only means they're sensitive to gluten, but it means that in order to get an IgG response to something, uh, that uh, protein has to penetrate the wall of the gut and be recognized by the immune system as foreign. Uh, You can demonstrate that 100% of people have antibodies, IgG antibodies to gluten. That's fascinating. So if you don't mind, let me play devil's advocate for a second. So so the, the, the criticism that I see is that, well, when you eat a food in order to your body creates these IgG in order to become tolerant to it, right? And so it's not a measure of if you're intolerant to it, it's just a measure of if you've been eating that food recently. Is that a false statement? Uh, That's or... an absolutely false statement. Okay. Um, <laughs> normally, that food that you're eating is broken down with digestive enzymes and the microbiome into individual sugar molecules, individual amino acids, and individual fatty acids, which are then absorbed you know, through the wall of the gut. So that, let's use an example like broccoli. Um, so your immune system has never, ever, ever seen broccoli. It has seen components of broccoli in terms of sugars and proteins and even a little fat, but it's never actually seen broccoli. Now, compare that if you have intestinal permeability, you now have gaps in the wall of your gut. And partially digested broccoli has the potential to go across the wall of the gut and 80% of your immune system sits there and it goes, holy cow, what the heck is that? I have never seen broccoli in my life. That is a foreign protein that I have never seen. And my job is to make an antibody to it because it's foreign. And if I ever see it again, I will be ready. So you cannot make an antibody to broccoli uh, by eating broccoli. But if you have leaky gut, you absolutely can make an antibody to broccoli. And I see it. I have people who have antibodies when we first start with them to romaine lettuce, just as an example, because they eat a lot of romaine lettuce. Now, here's the exciting news, and this is what I've written about. If you look at my patients, and you follow them, we'll get back to gluten for a second. You treat their leaky gut, you seal their leaky gut, and it can take a year, take nine months. I think the longest it's ever taken us is about a year and a half. Uh, All of those antibodies to gluten go away. They disappear. Your immune system gets retrained and it forgets. And that's actually what's really exciting. Same for the most part with food sensitivities. You, once you seal the leaky gut, 
then the immune system doesn't see these things anymore. And particularly if you've got a great microbiome, microbiome normal educates the immune system about what it should be interested in and what it doesn't need to be interested in. It also should, in, should educate the immune system about we're your microbiome, we're the line of defense, we got your back, whatever is coming down the pipe that this guy swallows, we got it. Believe it or not, there are bacteria that love to eat gluten, love to eat gluten. Uh, unfortunately, most of them are all gone in all of us, but uh, we have, as I talk about in Gut Check, if you look at super old people who are thriving in their late 90s, early 100s, they have a set of bacteria that actually eat uh, xenobiotics, uh, all these crazy toxic compounds that, you know, unfortunately we're, uh, eat, we're eating every day, microplastics, but they eat them for these guys. And it's one of the really remarkable things from the Human Microbiome Project. It's like, holy cow, these guys, you know, have a, have a, microbiome that's right there on the front line ready for all this crud that we're ingesting. And most of us don't have those guys. So, so the really exciting thing in both of my papers was, yeah, leaky gut exists. You can be sensitive, IgG sensitivity to foods that you eat if you have leaky gut. And the good news is you can reverse these IgG antibodies, which is Oh, exciting. that's incredible. Yeah, yeah. So that's, first of all, I mean, I, that's very eye-opening when it comes to the IgG stuff because reading just general criticism seems to be wrong in the sense that, you know, you're, you're saying like, no, these, it sh you should not have high IgG antibodies to foods. That only happens when you have leaky gut. And... By definition, then, if you close the leaky gut, right, if you seal it shut, over a period of time, all those IgG antibodies should go down. So theoretically, if a person doesn't have a leaky gut for, let's say, a number of years, they should not have any IgG antibodies to foods. Is that correct? Or very Great little? Great question. Uh, it, it depends. Uh, for instance, we... When I first made the, you know, yes and no lists of foods in the plant paradox, uh, a lot of it was based on uh, my patients' observations, and this is before we had these tests, uh, of what, you know, foods they reacted to. And I'll give me an example. Uh, originally, when I wrote the plant paradox, almonds were not allowed uh, mm -hmm. of any sort. And that's because a lot of my patients with rheumatoid arthritis uh, had noticed that almonds flared their rheumatoid arthritis. And there's a lectin in the peel of an almond. And so uh, we just eliminated almonds uh, just because of that. And when I wrote The Plant Paradox, my editor says, man, you know, you are really mean. You're taking away everything from everybody. And, you know, come on, throw us a bone here. And so I said, well, um, almonds. If you, if you peel almonds, the, you'll remove, you know, the, the lectin from the peel. And, okay, I'll give you blanched almonds and blanched almond flour. And we were all pretty happy with that. When we started having the ability to look at IgG food sensitivities, a lot of my patients who had gotten a whole lot better, but they weren't all the way there, uh, almonds kept popping up. And so I'll give you a, a great story. We have a, have a woman who had really awful psoriasis, um, psoriasis all over, psori psoriatic arthritis. And the drugs really weren't making a dent in her. They made her sick. And so we put her on the program. And her psoriasis resolved, except for this one two-inch patch in the middle of her back. She was covered with it. And she said, man, you know, I'm happy. I'm not any meds. But isn't it interesting that, you know, 
everything's gone except this two inch patch on my back. And I said, well, would you mind if we do, you know, a food sensitivity on you? Because uh, unfortunately insurance doesn't pay for it. And it's a couple hundred dollars. And she says, yeah, that'd be really cool. So she gets the report back and two of the things jump out, which and it's almond flour and vanilla bean. And Interesting. she, like so many other people, was making almond flour cookies and cakes and putting vanilla extract in it. And so she got the report about two weeks before I saw her to review it. And so she gets the report and she says, ah, I'm rid of my almond flour cookies and my vanilla extract. So I see her. She says, you're not going to believe this. And she said, in two weeks, my two-inch spot has gone down to one inch just by taking almond flour and vanilla out. Wow. And yeah, it's, it's those kind of wow things that have really impressed me that th this is real. And because we now have, when, when these things first came out, uh, I basically said, look, I don't know how valid this is. Um, Point. you got nothing to lose. Um, let's trust that this test is right. When it says you have, you know, severe reaction to these things, let's eliminate it. If it says that you're moderate and the low at moderate end, let's just be careful with it. Let's just do that. And let's see. And of course, my patients are good experimenters. So we would then look at that. We'd look at how they feel or they, we'd look at their disease process. But we'd also then look at their leaky gut markers. And we'd have people who did really good, but they still had markers of leaky gut. It was a whole lot better than it was previously. But markers is an IgG? Uh, so, so, yeah, so IgG, anti-zonulin IgG, and anti-actin IgG are the two main markers that, that I use in our lab. And, and the anti-zonulin is just like a lab marker that LabCorp would have? No, uh, only certain labs will run it. We use Vibrant America, uh, Vibrant Wellness, uh, but other labs can run it. Uh, there's all... Okay. There's a fascinating story on how the whole zonulin uh, thing came about that you, I, I don't need to bore you with, but actually I'll bore you real quick. Um, so uh, Dr. Fasano uh, wanted to figure out how gluten caused leaky gut. And he actually looked at a cholera model. And cholera, of course, causes massive watery diarrhea, and that's how you die with it. And he found that cholera released this compound called zonulin. And zonulin uh, uh -huh. attaches to a receptor on the wall of the gut that breaks tight junction. And the tight junctions have acted. So when, when Dr. Fasano discovered this, all of us said, oh man, this is great. All we got to do now is measure zonulin. And we'll know who's got leaky gut and who doesn't. So we started measuring zonulin and lo and behold, only about 15% of people who we would swear had leaky gut had elevated zonulin levels. And we're going, wow, so much for that theory. And so then people like Vibrant said, no, 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 no. We got this all wrong. Zonulin would be attached to receptors. It wouldn't be in the bloodstream in most people. But zonulin is an abnormal protein. And if you had leaky gut, then zonulin would leak through the leaky gut and you'd see, your immune system would see it and make an antibody to zonulin mm -hmm. because it's a foreign compound. And they said, we ought to measure anti-zonulin. Lo and behold, the minute that test became available, all the pieces locked together and you go, cool, there it is. You know, Pisano was right. He just was measuring the wrong thing. And it's the wow. same way with the actin. If, if these 
tight junctions are broken, then actin with the broken actin will go across and you'll make an antibody to actin. And what's really cool, and this is kind of nerdy stuff, we usually see that as people heal their leaky gut, that anti-actin IgG goes down first. In other words, the tight junctions are not being broken as much, followed by anti-zon. And, and so it's really fun. So we can actually give people, you know, a report card of, of how they're doing. And, you know, it's when, you, when we ask people to give stuff up that they love, um, it's nice to have a report card that says, oh, look, you know, look, you're your anti-actin is half what it was four months ago. Anti-zonulin is moving a little bit, but look at the anti -actin. And then they go, oh. And it's the same way with the food sensitivities. When we took these, you know, what seemed to be silly things away from people, then we could watch this movement of their gut ceiling accelerate. And that's what- That's very interesting. I actually did not know about the anti-zonulin or anti-actin uh, markers. And so what you do is you check the IgG for which foods they may be sensitive to. You eliminate right. those foods and then you measure progress from the anti-zonulin and the anti-actin. And right. I guess mainly the, I guess you would test the anti-zonulin first to see if they have leaky gut and then the anti-actin to measure progress because it's going to be quicker response. Yeah, so we measure anti-zonulin and anti-actin, you know, first. We also measure anti-LPSs, um, lipopolysaccharides, mm. but that's a whole nother subject. Um, okay. But, and that, that contributes as well. But the, I mean, the, again, if you had asked me 20 years ago when I was first getting into this, what I thought about leaky gut, I really probably would have said it was pseudoscience. Because we, we really had no way to measure this or quantify it. But now it's not only measurable and quantifiable, but now you can see when you ask people to remove certain foods from their diet, you can see a response. That's, that's really interesting. So what other typical lab markers do you see change in response to, like, for example, do you see HSCRP going down? Yes. Do you see homocysteine changing? Do you see uh, LDL well, changing? So homocysteine really has nothing to do uh, really with leaky gut. Uh, it's, okay. much more, it's much more sensitive to whether you carry the MTHFR mutations. Um, but we, we, like I say, my practice is mostly autoimmune and we measure autoimmune markers on everyone who walks through the door. So we see Hashimoto's markers, antithyroglobulin go down, mm -hmm. anti, uh, uh, thyroid peroxidase go down. We see anti-nuclear antibody go down. We see double stranded DNA go down and so on and so forth. We see rheumatoid factor go down. We see anti-CCP3 go down. And quite honestly, if we see these things go up uh, in someone who they're way down or turned off, we know that you know they've reintroduced something to their diet or they've had a viral infection that has caused uh, new mm -hmm. leaky. So, yeah, so these are measurable things, which is exciting. So it's one thing for a patient to say, oh, you know, my brain fog is better, but we can measure leaky brain and we can measure antibodies to Purkinje cells, to dopam dopaminergic cells, to neurons, to myelin. And we can watch these antibodies go down in parallel with their leaky gut going. Hippocrates is right. You know, all disease begins in the gut. Under what circumstance would we recommend taking an antibiotic, given all the damage that it does to the gut? But on the other hand, antibiotics have also saved a lot of people. True. I mean, life-threatening infections, it's a good idea. Uh, uh, chlamydia actually um, 
is one of the culprits in coronary artery disease. We found okay. chlamydia in plaques in coronary arteries. That's uh, very interesting. We, yeah. we, so it, it, it's not to be taken lightly. Um, syphilis was one of the greatest causes of atherosclerosis that anyone ever discovered. So yeah, it's a good idea. Plus the good news is that uh, a lot of these sexually transmitted diseases are sensitive to a very mild antibiotic tetracycline. And tetracycline is interesting in, in only the only published human study of coronary plaque regression and calcification was done in giving uh, human beings uh, tetracycline and a, a host of herbal supplements. And there's this fun theory that oral bacteria are one of the main drivers of plaque and coronary arteries. And just for people to ruminate on, uh, we have plaque in our teeth. And that plaque is calcification caused by bacteria making that calcification. And the only mm -hmm. thing else that calcifies is these plaques in our coronary arteries. And so there's, and that tetracycline reversed it in the only human study that was done. Now, do I go around and eat tetracycline all the time? No, but, uh, I think that taking care of our oral microbiome is one protective way to protect my coronary arteries. I see. And, and you're and, saying if somebody had to take like a antibiotic, something like tetracycline would, uh, would be the one of the first, is that similar to uh doxycycline? Yeah, that's doxycycline. That's one of the okay. tetracycline. Correct. Okay. Uh, Interesting. Yeah. But, and so th these things are, they're, they're various strength as you will. One of the things that really happened to us that was unfortunate. And I lived through it in the mid 1970s, broad spectrum antibiotics were developed and broad spectrum, as the name implies, kind of kills everything, uh, gram positive bacteria, gram negative bacteria. And it was miraculous for us as physicians, because previous to this, we had to figure out what bacteria was causing problems. And then we had to figure out if it was sensitive to our armamentarium of antibiotics. And this took a number of days, if we could even culture the bacteria. And so we're kind of twiddling our thumbs, waiting for news. Well, as broad spectrum antibiotics came out, then it's great. And now we can shotgun our patients and we can just blast them uh, with a cluster bomb. We go, great, a little did we know, because we didn't even know about this microphone. Little did we know that, yeah, we were killing whatever bacteria was the cause, but we were wiping out our entire microbiome in the process. And it's like, son of a gun, uh, wish we had known that. But now these prospector antibiotics are given, you know, a person walks in with a runny nose or a sore throat or a cough. The well-meaning family practitioner says, well, here, you know, have a z pack or here, have a Leviquin and, or a, a bladder infection. Here, have this. And it gives them something to do. Usually it's caused by a virus and it's going to have no effect, except it's going to wipe out their microbiome. And so we're all walking around, thanks to broad spectrum antibiotics, which are also fed to our animals with a, it's a wasteland in there. So let's start talking a little bit about what are things I've, I've actually discovered some things, uh, over the, a number of years on how to counteract these food sensitivities since I am, uh, very sensitive, uh, but I'm curious. What have you found as the best things? Because, you know, somebody like me, for example, I'm sensitive. I was sensitive to everything besides chicken, fish, and meat, essentially, right? It was a carnivore diet. 
I, I was able to eat a little romaine lettuce or stuff like that without any significant problem, maybe a cucumber. But essentially, even that I was like, I had like a very minor reaction to. But just like all meat, I was fine. So I obviously needed to figure out things to counteract these things. And in, in other times, people, I find people are just, they want to eat what they want to eat a lot of times. They're going to, you know, they'll, they'll do their thing maybe 80% of the time. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll follow a diet 80% of the time. And then when they're on vacation or on the weekend, when they go out to eat, they, they uh, fudge a little bit, right? And that's kind of normal, I feel like. How do you suggest, um, what are the, the best things that you've found over the years to get rid of these food sensitivities so that somebody can then eat these foods and not react to them? And not everything per se, like I'm not saying they should start eating beans and you know every grain out there, right? <laughs> but like maybe they can start eating more nuts or seeds or something like that. Well, one of the things that's been interesting, um, you're over in Tel Aviv, but uh, right now, a lot of my patients with bad autoimmune diseases who go into remission, they go on vacation to Europe, and then they go to France, and they have baguettes and croissants, and they go to Italy, and they have beans, and they have pasta, and they have pizza. And they don't react and they come, they go, oh my gosh, you know, Dr. Gundry has cured me. I can have these things again. Yay. And they come back to the United States and within a week or two. And so they start eating our pizza and, you know, our food, our breads. And within two weeks, um, they're back suffering. We send a kid up. Their leaky gut is back. Their autoimmune is reactivated. And they go, what? You know, you cured me. And, you know, I was doing great. I ate all these things in Europe. And what the heck? I said, you came back and ate our stupid food and full of glyphosate. And we haven't, you know, glyphosate is one of the great perils of our time. So, um. Yeah, it's actually exciting. For, for instance, I can go to Italy or France and eat these foods, and I don't have any problem. I won't come near them in the United States because that's so have... interesting. So you're saying that the main reason why somebody wouldn't tolerate wheat in the U.S. is because a glyphosate, whereas a croissant in Europe and France wouldn't be a problem. Correct. Now these are people who no longer have antibodies to gluten or wheat. Um, mm -hmm. if you walk over there with antibodies to gluten, you're, you're going to react to it. But okay. these are people who have lost their sensitivity. But so what does glyphosate do? It does two things. First of all, glyphosate was patented as an antibiotic. It was not patented as a weak. And it is really good at killing a lot of bacteria in our gut. And in fact, it's really good at killing uh, serotonin, tryptophan pathway bacteria. Uh, and we, oh, that's in really interesting. You really just stepped good. on something that, that was one of the key things that I found, but continue there. Yeah, I didn't know that. It's, uh, they really target these bacteria. Number two, glyphosate by itself can cause leaky gut. Um, so, so we got a kind of a double whammy. It's an antibiotic against our bacteria and it in itself can cause leaky gut. And the problem is it's ubiquitous. Uh, it's in our wine. It's in, I mean, almost all oats tested in this country, uh, test positive for glyphosate, often a hundred times higher than the legal limit. Um, what about and, nuts and, and seeds? Do nuts and seeds nuts have seeds glyphosate? Here. Okay, because they're okay. they're contained, um, glyphosate can't get to them. But glyphosate is sprayed. Glyphosate used to be associated with GMO. Now that's kind of where it came from. But glyphosate is now primarily used as a desiccant to kill a crop uh, like corn, like oats, like wheat so that you can harvest it and mm -hmm. harvesting a 
dead plant, believe it or not, is incredibly more efficient uh, because water costs a lot to haul. And mm -hmm. these major corporations, you no longer wait for a field to become ripe because you've got these multi-million dollar harvesting machines that need to be on one field on a certain day. And so what you do is, well, that crop isn't, isn't ready yet, but that's where the machine is going to be. So two weeks before, we're going to spray the entire corn crop or the entire wheat crop or the entire oat crop with glyphosate. That'll kill it. It'll be dry and we can harvest it. Now, nobody goes around afterwards spraying it all down, washing the glyphosate. Mm -hmm. And so that not only goes into our food supply in grains and cereals and breads, but the same stuff is fed to our animals. So now our animals are now the direct link between glyphosate and the corn and the soybeans and the wheat that they eat. And so when we eat them, we're getting a dose of glyphosate. As well. So even with the, uh, so let's say we're eating organic chicken as well. I, I heard somewhere that you said as well, even if it's organic, it's still not, you're still getting that dose of glyphosate or, or, or it's still not good, but for what reason? Yeah. Well, yeah, they're eating corn and soybeans in general, you know, right? Organic corn and soybeans. So one of the problems, so organic chicken, uh, everybody thinks, well, that's, that's better than feedlot chicken. There's, uh, you know, a hundred thousand chicken in a warehouse, uh, even though they're, uh, and they're, even though they're fed organic corn and soybeans, they're getting mostly, uh, an, a short chain omega-3 fat, omega-6 fat called uh, linoleic acid. And so these guys have 25 times more linoleic acid than would normally be found in a chicken that was out on a pasture eating bugs and grass. And uh, I talk about this in the new book. So even though you're eating an organic chicken, that chicken is a giant inflammatory piece of flesh because it has, it's been fed linoleic acid. And that's a lot of my patients who really got a whole lot better, you know, removing lectin containing foods. But as I've written about in some of my books, the final straw was when we took away their organic chicken. And it was removing those compounds that finally, you know, pushed them over the edge and they were fine. So now there's. So do these organic chicken, let's say, uh, have, or let's say non-organic chicken, when you're eating a chicken breast or, you know, a chicken leg or whatever it is, does that have glyphosate in it? So regular chickens, yes. Uh, most organic chickens, no. But okay. the, the problem is they will still have lectins from corn and soybeans. And mm -hmm. they'll also have the uh, omega-6 linoleic acid. Okay. Now, there's, a, there's a great guy. Uh, I have no uh, investment in him. Uh, he, he's Farmer Dan from Texas, and he has a company called lectinlightchicken.com. And he feeds his, his chickens or pasture rays, and he feeds them lectin-free uh, supplement food. And he just announced this week that he now has lectin-free pork. Uh, Interesting. And believe me, it's the best chicken I've ever had in my life. And wow. It's, and but something you just mentioned, uh, just my personal experience there, but something you just mentioned triggered me about glyphosate, that now I'm like a glyphosate, uh, anti-glyphosate fanatic. <laughs> because... <laughs> Uh, I used to be like, okay, yeah, glyphosate is is, is probably bad, right? Like, I, I never really looked into it. But what I did look into very much was uh, the whole tryptophan pathway. And so something I noticed about myself was that 
Uh, number one is that I was severely deficient in tryptophan, even though I was consuming high tryptophan foods, where, whereas it seemed that way, right? Right. And so I discovered a few reasons for that. Some of them are genetic. I have a tryptophan hydroxylase 2 gene that doesn't convert it as well to 5-HTP. That's one reason. But the whole glyphosate thing that you're saying that that impairs the ability of tryptophan to, uh, first of all, uh, either get to serotonin or tryptophan does a whole lot of other things. It creates indoles that create this tolerance in the gut. Um, uh, so that, that, that's like another, I, I think like that's definitely something. Cause I was thinking about, it, I was like, how did it, you know, like I somehow got here today, right. Uh, through 10,000 years of evolution or whatever it is, right. A uh, hundred thousand, you know, whatever the number of years of evolution of mankind. And, you know, we've been eating grains for a while. It's like, how did, how did it, like, if I lived a uh, hundred years ago, I'd be dead or something. Right. Because like my, I was. I'm intolerant to all these foods. Like, how is this possible? And the answer is that we didn't have glyphosate a hundred years ago, right? I mean, that that, that could definitely be uh, that's a, a huge, that's a huge of, piece yeah. of it. Uh, no, we yeah we didn't, and we didn't have antibiotics a hundred years ago, and we right. had an intact gut microbiome, uh, and you know, all these super old people around the world. Uh, the good news is they all, as a general rule, live in small remote villages and they luckily have not been exposed like most of us. And that's why a hundred years ago, most of us could tolerate grains because we had a great defense system against these things. We had bacteria that, you know, loved to munch on this stuff. and we had bacteria that could produce compounds that would protect the wall of the gut and a lot of the gut check. We now know that you, let's suppose we want to make a butyrate, um, which is probably the most important short chain fatty acid there is. And in so many ways, and we won't go into that today, but and butyrate in general is made from fiber that bacteria eat well not so fast it turns out you may need for the final guy to make butyrate you may need compounds that four or five different bacteria make that then the final guy can assemble into making making butyrate if you're missing one of those guys it's very much like an assembly line if you don't have this guy you you're screwed you can eat all the fiber you want but if you don't have the middleman to process then you're not going to get the end result and it's the same way with the tryptophan pathway so if glyphosate is knocking out two or three of the steps that bacteria provide then you know you're screwed and you can eat all the tryptophan you want but you're not going to get 5-htp or serotonin and that's so, been one of the real enlightening things uh, in researching the new book. So what do you think, what are like some of the top recommendations to closing the leaky gut or uh, counteracting these food sensitivities uh, as instead of, you know, as opposed to just staying away from these foods, what are the things somebody could do besides butyrate? Because I think that is, um, that's my favorite, by the way, uh, resistant starch and butyrate. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I talk about that a lot. So I feel like people already know about that. You also talk about it a lot. Um, besides that, what do you feel like some of the top things somebody can do to counteract these food sensitivities? Well, avoidance is, is quite frankly, number one. Um, you can, of course. I mean, I make compounds that seal a leaky gut and they're really good at it. Uh, but the problem is you can seal your leaky gut, but if you keep swallowing razor blades, then you're just going to slice it open every day. Right. I make compounds that absorb lectins and other people do, and there are lectin absorbing foods. I mean, okra is a phenomenal food for absorbing lectins. Yeah. Everybody ought to be eating more okra in my humble opinion. Uh, 
One of the problems with resistant starch is that the, the Sonnenbergs from Stanford have, have shown is that you could eat all this resistant starch and fiber, and they have shown that unless you have precursor, other short-chain fatty acids, you will never make butyrate. And again, that's one of the real eye-openers of their studies. And, I, you know, I've come to agree completely with them. It's, there's these missing pieces that you've got to provide for the assembly. And quite frankly, you can swallow all the butyrate in the world, uh, and it's not going to get to where it needs to go. And that's, you know, that's why I made a, a nano-encapsulated butyrate. Or, oh, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah, and, that, and that's actually why it works. Uh, and I've, I've had the, the scientists from Pendulum Life uh, with Ekermansia and their uh, butyricum bacteria. And oh, I just all, bought that. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah the C. butyricum. Yeah. I, it's, a big, it's, it's a big deal. Uh, you really need Ekermansia to assist it. And establishing a niche. So, and that's the beauty of the Human Microbiome Project. Uh, I mean, we didn't even know these guys existed, you know, until 2006, and the, the Microbiome Project finished in 2017. And, and now we know that each day we learn something new. A hundred percent. My, just my two cents, just based on I've been doing experiments on myself for like 10 years, more, 16 Good years. For you, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, so just uh, the things that helped me the most were resistant starch, um, niacin, tryptophan, fish oil, and uh, I think Tutka uh, also was, was one of them. So I brought up Tutka. Um, yeah. What do you think of those? Uh, I take Tudka every day. I have for years. Um, recently read a book about a, a, a Japanese man who kind of single-handedly uh, saved the Akita breed from extinction after World War II. And uh, as an interesting aside, the Akitas are used as bear hunting dogs in um uh, snowy Japan and uh, they go out and hunt bears and Akitas can actually fight a bear. And the reason oh, they go hunt bears is they want the bear gallbladder in Chinese medicine. A bear gallbladder is one of the highest prized, um, foods for longevity. And lo and behold, Tudka is bear by now. All Tudka now is, is produced without killing bears, but there's, uh, and we just talked about this on my podcast with Pendulum, there's now really cool evidence that these bile acid metabolites like Tudka are unique in super old people and that some of these bile acids like Tudka have amazing anti-inflammatory properties in the brain and that mm. these bile acids circulate into the brain. And so who would know? I mean, my goodness, you know, bear, bear gallbladder is rev, you know, revered in Chinese medicine. And then you go, oh, I see. Uh, no wonder it's so popular. No wonder you want to go kill a bear. Do you want to hear about the one health hack that is sure to change your life? Okay, here it is. Subscribing to this podcast. 67% of listeners aren't subscribed to the show, so please don't forget to show your support by hitting the subscribe button now. You'll not only be supporting the show, but also investing in yourself and your health journey, all while helping to keep us ad-free. Have you found anything that decreases LPA? The good news is, um, yeah, I... I have a big practice in people with LPLA because first people should realize that statin drugs increase LPLA. I didn't and, know that. Oh, yeah. 
uh, actually I, often. Well, let's give a, could you just give a short background on LP little a? Like it's, it's something that's quite significant, increasing cardiovascular disease, right? Correct. Is that, okay. It, it, it's actually, so it's, it's a gene that people primarily of Northern European uh, ancestry inherit. Although it, it's present in the Middle East, uh, I've seen a few people from China and Japan who carry it. Um, but it's, it's a gene that makes what many of us think is the world's meanest, nastiest, stickiest ball of cholesterol. And it literally has a protein corkscrew attached to it. And this corkscrew literally drills into the wall of your blood vessel and sticks. It's the number one cause of familial coronary artery disease. It's the number one cause of aortic stenosis. And it's the number one cause of vascular dementia. Now, that's different than Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a big deal, in my opinion. Now, uh, niacin will bring down LP little a. And sometimes you have to take a lot, but the good news is a few years ago, a test was developed called OX, capital P, capital L, dash, APO, B. And it's a blood test. And it actually is the first test that can actually measure the activity of LP little a. In other words, whether it's sticky or not. And the good news about this test is for years, I just bent over backwards and punished my patients with niacin to drive their LP little a down to 30 and or below. But with the advent of this test, we can now see that I now have some people with, give an example last week, with an LP little a of 57. And they don't activate it on their OxPL FOB test. And so we can track that now. And I've become mm -hmm. kinder and gentler now that we, we have a method of tracking LP little A. Interesting. But APOB. I check it. Does, do you think it causes heart disease? I mean, there's um, basically, I mean, so... There's Mendelian randomization studies. There's a lot of information. And basically that tracks very well with LDL cholesterol as well, or pretty well, reasonably well. So if for most people, they're measuring LDL cholesterol, and that's really just a measure of things like ApoB, or maybe, you know, that, that's a correlation between ApoB and LDL particle count. That's kind of really what people are looking for. Do those things cause heart disease or not? Absolutely not. Okay, excellent. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to dive in. I mean, you can dive into it as much as you want, but cholesterol, uh, cholesterol has nothing to do with heart. Okay, um, even with the Mendelian randomization studies and 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 the drug trials, disease. You have to have inflammation on the surface of your blood vessel. You have to have a break in the like calyx. You could have, and I have patients with LDL cholesterols. Of 500 apple bees of 300 they have oh my no gosh. markers of vascular inflammation they have no oxidized pl apple b and when we do a ct coronary angiogram on them they have zero plaque in their coronary artery we have people with ldls of 40 who have plaque up and down their arteries because their that LDL is oxidized and their blood vessels are inflamed, and no wonder it's. So you think, it, according to that theory, something like a PCSK9 inhibitor? Well, I guess you you could say it might work if someone has high LPA, because uh, yeah, yeah, if one of the B PCSK9 inhibitors will lower LP little A. Right. But you're saying that it won't reduce heart attack or cardiovascular disease because of lowering ApoB or anything like that? No. Interesting. And drugs work. They don't work by lowering ApoB. We've known now for 15 years that statin drugs work 
by reducing toll-like receptors. They hit the mute button on toll-like receptors on the vascular endothelium. So they reduce the inflammatory signal. We thought they worked by lowering FOB and LDL because that's all we have to measure. Once we've learned the mechanism that statin drugs work, that was a side effect, lowering FOB and LDL. The effect was putting a mute button on toll right receptor. But what about the other drugs that lower cholesterol, lower LDL particle number, whatever, and there's drugs like bempedoic acid, that's a new one, there's PCSK9 inhibitors, there's... Right, so PCSK9 um, inhibitors. Yeah, and those those will work well, but what we're learning about some of the fibrates is they're changing the bile acid composition. And that is changing the inflammatory signal out of the gut. So you're back. saying the the drugs that are working are also working in another way. So for example, I mean bempedoc acid also lowers HSCRP. I mean I get that is a a, a confounding variable. Um the PCSK9 inhibitor, I guess you could say the confounding variable is that it lowers LPA. So that actually took my uh, LPA from 45 to 6 in, in yeah. five days. Yeah. So that, that yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, a pre and the Mendelian randomization studies, you just think they're not worth much? Well, I mean, there are, there are people with familial hypercholesterolemia that those guys, as xanthelasmas and varieties, they're a different step altogether. But that is not the vast majority of human beings. And remember, people like the Catavans, uh, they basically have the same cholesterol profile as sweet, but Catavans have never been found to have evidence of coronary artery disease or cardiovascular disease, even though they smoke like fiend. And so you go, what the heck, you know, how'd that happen? And, you know, so there's... Interesting. Interesting. Um, one question I have about diet and all the... And this is something that I think about a lot, is like, I, I know that epidemiological studies are not very good, right? But True. when you look at epidemiological studies, you see that beans and like whole grains and things like that, like it's just like across the board, they seem, most of them, I, I can't say all of them, right? There's probably some exceptions, but most of them will be like, yes, it's people who eat this are healthier in X, Y, Z ways. Um, what I mean, what's your opinion of those studies? You think they're just they're garbage because they're epidemiological and it's a healthy user bias, or do you think that they're replacing it with junk food and junk food is you know just much worse? Or what's your opinion of those studies? Well, number one, uh, a lot of work coming out of Europe has suggested that beans and grains are a negative part of the Mediterranean diet, and it's compensated for by all the positive parts of the Mediterranean diet, like olive oil, like polyphenols. And so it was a negative effect that's being compensated. Oh, so you're and saying if, uh, if somebody's, if, like if a study shows that somebody's eating a lot of whole grains and beans, they're probably also eating a lot of olive oil. Yeah, exactly. Uh, there's a beautiful, I, I talked about this in the energy paradox and unlocking the keto code. So one of the blue zones, uh, which I talk a lot about in, in gut check, one of the blue zones is the Nagoyan peninsula in Costa Rica. And, uh, a certain author would have you believe that the reason they're a blue zone is they eat a lot of corn and beans. Uh, it turns out that all of Costa Rica eats a lot of corn and beans, and yet this one little area in the Nagoyan Peninsula seems to have extended lifespan. When you look at those people, they are sheep and goat herders, unlike any other part of Costa Rica. And their longevity is from the sheep and goat 
yogurts and cheeses they eat, like I talk about in the book. And their perception is that the grains and beans are actually a negative part of their diet that they have to put up with. And mm -hmm. so, uh, as I talk about in the book, a, a man sees what he wants to see and disregards the rest. And so if you're on a mission to convince people that grains and beans are really good for you, then you will cherry pick the information that you want people to see. You know, I have nothing against beans if you pressure cook them. Uh, they're, they can be part of a healthy diet. I've seen uh, somewhere that you said that uh, pressure cooking beans can't get rid of all of the lectins. No, no, Is it'll that... get rid of all lectins. Get it. Smoking okay. won't get rid of all lectins. Okay, but um, pressure cooking will. Yeah, but still, it's... yeah. Pressure cooking won't break gluten, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the things it won't break. So along the uh, lines of, of my dietary questions, um, something you're a big fan of is protein, restri uh, protein restriction of some, of some degree yeah. and yeah. also intermittent fasting of some degree. Right. As you know, and, and so I'm always a, like, I always like to play devil's advocate with myself and, you know, like, Obviously, there's a whole bunch of different sides to uh, the equation. On the one hand, protein restriction is something that the blue zones uh, do, which is which you talk about a lot, True. which uh, is a, is a great point, right? So that's uh, obviously a very good point in that favor. But then you have pe people like Peter Atia, for example, who talk about uh, you know you need to have a certain amount of protein if you want to build muscle. You need to spread that protein out. In order to, because you can't just have 100 grams of protein in one sitting, you're only going to be able to utilize, let's say, 40 grams, right? So you want to break it up. He says four times in the day, 40, 40, 40, 40, whatever. Now, you know, I think that's that could be like uh, the high end. That's like one end of the uh, spectrum, if you will, right? Like that's a lot of protein. But, you know, I, I think where do you stand on on like... Meaning, like, what's your response to that kind of thinking? Well, so, number one, uh, Peter T is much younger than me. And, <laughs> you know, God bless him. Uh, and, you know, my, my objective is, you know, I, I want to catch up uh, you know, with people who I've seen successfully live to 106 years old uh, successfully. And... I study what they have done and you look at these super agers around the world. And one of the things that's consistent among these super agers is they don't eat a lot of animal protein. Uh, I would argue with Peter that the largest animals on earth, uh, don't eat any animal protein. Uh, a gorilla has more muscle than Peter will ever have. Uh, a horse has more muscle than Peter will ever have. And all they eat is leaves and grass. Uh, so to me, that, that's, that's a, he, he can have all the protein he wants, but at some point, one of the factors that when I look at my patients with super old people, 95 and above, and I have a bunch of them. They have very low insulin-like growth factor rates, very low. Mm -hmm. And one of the three stimulants of insulin-like growth factor is stimulating mTOR, and animal amino acids stimulate mTOR much better than plant amino acids. Uh, we know it's a long combination. And in my patients, and at Washington University in St. Louis and St. Louis University who have studied calorie restricted taking their animal protein away from them and keeping the amount of protein intact dramatically lowers insulin-like growth factor. And I see that in my, now I personally think that the most potent way to do that is time restricted eating. And that has been shown with the Italian cyclist study. And to Peter's credit, he used to, as you know, be a big uh, fasting guy. 
three day fast, five day fast, seven day fast. And just recently, bless his heart, he said, oops, I was wrong. Every time I fasted, I lost 10%, 15% of my muscle mass, and it took me a whole long time to get it back. If he had called me, I would have told him that that's what was going to happen. But, uh, but good for him because, you know, he, he comes out. And so his dogma, now based on evidence, he now says, whoops, you know, I was wrong. Good for him. I see. It, okay. It, you know, it's like Joe Mercola. Um, Joe, uh, I've known him a number of years. He dives in the deep end on something. And he adopts it 1,000%. And he gets really excited about it and tells everybody how excited he is about it. And this is the thing that will change your life. But then he'll go, oops, fasting was one of those. He said, oops, you know, I was wrong. And here's why I was wrong. And so, but you know, like I, we started this conversation, you will have people who have not changed their dogma in 30 years, even though the evidence is, is very clear that that dogma has not stood the test of time. Right. So, um, I have a, another question, uh, uh, two more dietary questions. One about fiber. You're a big fan of fiber. I'm a big fan of fiber. I eat a ton of fiber, like over a hundred grams a day, which I think is a lot. Yeah. Um, if I eat too much fiber, I will get gas. Is that a bad thing? Is that a sign of I'm eating too, if somebody's eating too much fiber, is that a sign of you either need to cut down the fiber or it's like. I've heard you say that, and I've read also hydrogen sulfide, there's benefits to it. Uh, all these gaseous compounds, there can be benefit to it. Um, yep. Also, like, let's say if I take NAC, my uh, gas smells like hydrogen sulfide. <laughs> so uh, yep. is that a bad thing? If, you know, if you start having smelly gas, should you not take something or, you know, uh, what, what's your opinion on that? So, I, you know, I devoted an entire book, The Energy Paradox, to gasotransmitters. And gasotransmitters are part of the communication system between the gut microbiome and uh, their sisters, the mitochondria. And gasotransmitters are incredibly important. And as I joke, uh, you want to step on the gas. And so, uh, <laughs> Gorillas, actually, I've never, I've not yet gone to visit the gorillas, but one of the things that people who go visit them is that they are constantly farting. <laughs> just a smelly mess. And yeah, so don't, yeah. So you think it's not a sign of ill health? It's just. Oh, well, no, no. It's, it's one of the best possible things you can I mean, that's the, so interesting. Okay. Yeah. All right. Last question. Um, uh, it's, yeah, I'd say this is the last question. Order from best to worst. Okay. I'm going to give you five foods. <laughs> uh, grass fed red meat. I know you're against red meat. Um, and, and I, I agree with you there. I think there's evidence there. Uh, non grain fed chicken. So non-organic, non, uh, uh, sorry, non-organic grain-fed chicken. Okay, so regular chicken you get in, in, in the store. So beans, the, oh, I see beans no, and white rice. So those are four. Beans, oh. white rice, grain-fed chicken, grass-fed red meat. Order from so, one to four from uh, most problematic to least problematic. So uh, most problematic probably is white rice. Um, okay, right, that's surprising. Okay, right behind is is beans. Um, you'll okay. see in the new book, and I've been I've been warning people since the plant paradox about this uh, sugar molecule that's in beef, lamb, and pork called new five GC. 
And I got interested in it as a Zeno transplant surgeon when we were doing pig to baboon transplants. And there was this molecule that lines the blood vessels of pigs, beef, and, and lamb, sheep, that we make an antibody to. Uh, it's called new 5 gc We have a sugar molecule called new 5 ac They're identical molecules except for the difference of one oxygen molecule. They're otherwise identical. Uh, chicken and fish carry new 5 ac like us. So there's always been a very strong association between red meat eating and heart disease, arthritis, cancer. Association does not mean causation. But as people will see in the new book, uh, that causation is now established. So, um, and I, I'll hold the punchline until January. But, so your worst food uh, is grass-fed, grass-finished beef, even compared to that commercial chick, if you had to eat one or the other. Okay, Darn. interesting. Yeah, darn. So, um, white rice, grass-fed red meat, number two, and then number three uh, and four, so between beans and, and grain-fed chicken. So grain fed chicken is going to win over beans. So then beans would be third worst and then grain fed chicken would be yeah. the best. Would be the, okay. The best. But would I eat it? No, but that's all you gave me to eat. Yeah. 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 Obviously. Yeah. I'm just, I, well, you know, I'm, I'm talking to an audience that many people are going to be eating some of these things, right? Sure. No, I, I understand that. But the, I mean, the good news is it's, you can find leaves anywhere. Uh, you can find olive oil anywhere. Uh, you can find walnuts, hazelnuts, just about anywhere. And you can, you know, I, I have a really sick person or diabetic or issues. I basically tell them, look, I want you to become a gorilla who lives in Italy. And they look at me funny and go, what do you mean? I said, I want you to eat a lot of leaves and pour olive oil on it and watch what happens. And it's amazing what happened. Okay. All right. Uh, I appreciate, I, I've learned uh, quite a lot of things on the podcast, as usual. Every time I have you on, it's it's been always uh, super interesting. The, um, yeah, I've been, been surprised by certain things that you've brought up. So always yeah. nice to learn uh, new things from somebody who's re really educated and I uh, like that you also have clinical experience and you're always learning new things and that's great. So thanks for coming on the podcast. A pleasure. And again, you know, I, this isn't my first rodeo. I didn't just jump off the turnip truck. I've been following my patients now for 25 years with these tests and asking them to take certain things, take certain foods out of their you know, diet and following what happens to them. And so far. You know, they've taught me. I'm just passing along the information. Yeah, exactly. I, I find that when I do health coaching and things like that, I get a lot of uh, experience from people. You know, I tell them to do things and you learn from your patients a lot. So uh, your new book is going to be The Gut Check. Gut Check. And that's going to be out when exactly? January 9th, 2024. Okay, gonna... so we're all going to have to wait for that. This is... <laughs> I gave, um, I gave you some teasers, but uh, you'll, you'll find out how, how Hippocrates knew to make a statement that all disease begins in the gut. It's, it's remarkable um, the degree of control of our fate, our gut microbiome has in, in all aspects, all aspects. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I think it's quite important. I agree. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Dr. Gundry. Gotcha. 67% of listeners aren't subscribed to the show, so please don't forget to show your support by hitting the subscribe button now. You'll not only be supporting the show, but also investing in yourself and your health journey, 
all while helping keep us ad-free. 